welcome back again. Today we are talking about fat, fat aka lipids. And I want to start our discussion by asking you to think about why we eat fat. Like, do we need it in our bodies? It gets villainized a lot because people say things like, oh, I just got to lose all my fat. I have too much fat here, I have too much fat there. But we actually need fat for a variety of useful functions. So what are those useful functions? One thing that we need fat for is it is our chief storage form of energy. We can store a lot of calories in our fat cells. Most people have enough stored fat that they could go without food for a few days, run a marathon, and still have energy because they burn off their fat stores. So that's really helpful, especially if you might get sick and you can't eat for a few days, or in our evolutionary times where we might not have enough food. All of that is really uh, biologically important to have a storage form of energy. Fat cells are great for storing energy because they can be tightly packed. They do not like water, so there's no water interspersed in them like there is for glycogen and carbohydrate. Uh, so they can be tightly packed. They can expand infinitely, so they can grow quite a bit, and you can always manufacture more fat cells. So that is why they're such wonderful storage forms of energy. Along with being our storage form of energy, Fat cells can actually secrete different hormones signaling to signal for appetite. So they're not just inert sitting there being fatty, right? They're actually metabolically active cells that are out there secreting messages that are helping us decide how much to eat, when to eat, etc., etc. The next function of fat cells is that they provide insulation. So in extreme temperatures, you know, People that have more fat aren't going to feel cold as quickly as people that have less fat, so they're providing insulation. They're providing cushioning for our internal organs. We really need some fat so that things aren't like bumping up against all of our body walls and bruising themselves. Fat is also integral in our cell membrane, so we have a phospholipid bilayer for each cell's membrane, more about that to come, and that's made up of fat. Fat is in different hormones and vitamins. Vitamin D is actually fat, so bet you may not have known that. Uh, and we need to have fat in our bodies and we need to eat fat in order to get those vitamins or those hormones and make those hormones. Fat's presence in different hormones like estrogen, testosterone, progesterone can be why like people that have eating disorders or at a lower body weight than is healthy for them might have hormonal imbalances. So they may not menstruate regularly, Fat is integral in that process. Fat is also integral in moving other fats around the body. So it's in uh, substances called lipoproteins, lipid and protein, and that's moving cholesterol around our bodies. So fat has all these wonderful functions, very important. And so we need to eat fat so that our body can do all those things. And fat also has different functions in food. We need fat in food because of nutrients that are fat soluble. So our vitamins A, D, E, and K are fat soluble nutrients. They're only gonna be found in the fat in foods. So we need to have some fat to better obtain these vitamins. That's another reason that fat's in food. Fat is also a really concentrated source of calories. So that can be very helpful, especially like if you're going on a hiking trip. Fat's an efficient, efficient source of energy. You could have like a quarter cup of nuts or you could have, you know, I don't know, three, four, five cups of greens, and it's going to get you the same calories. So if you are you know, trying to take something with you for quick calories, you're probably gonna want something with fat in it. Also, I don't know if you know this, but food with fat in it tastes pretty good. So whenever we add fat to food, it usually improves the taste of the food. And so we need fat in food because like, we want life to be enjoyable. So that's a good reason too. kinds of fat. Well, there's three different kinds of fat, sterols, triglycerides, and phospholipids, and I'm going to take you through all of them right now. All right, my nutrition friends, we're talking about the different types of lipids. So what are they? And lipid is just another word for fat. It's like the science word for fat. So you can say lipid, you can say fat, either one. But there are three big classes of lipids. The first is sterols, then we have triglycerides and phospholipids. 
So those are the three main classes. And then there are some branch off points. So there are multiple different types of sterols and multiple different types of triglycerides. There are two different types of phospholipids, but we're not gonna get into them for nutrition's sake. So I'm not illuminating them on the chart. If we go back to the three main types of lipids, sterile, triglyceride, and phospholipid, the first one I wanna get into are the triglycerides because the triglycerides make up most of the fat in your body and most of the fat that we eat. You've probably heard of some of the triglyceride classes. The first is saturated fatty acids. Then we have trans fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, or MUFAs, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, UFA. And I have to tell you that I just love saying MUFA and PUFA. So uh, I, I always use the abbreviations for those because they're so cute. And then there are subclasses of PUFAs that are important for our purposes. There are subclasses of all the others as well, but we're just gonna highlight two of the PUFAs, which are omega-6 fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are probably like the well, most well-known PUFA because they are in things like fish oil supplements, fish. We're always talking about trying to get more of those. So you probably have heard of omega-3s before. All right, so triglycerides, as I said, are most of the fat in our bodies and in food. So they have the three fat classes are really, really relevant to nutrition. And this is what they look like. They are composed of a glycerol molecule and then three fatty acid chains. So you can see the glycerol is in blue here and then the three fatty acid chains are highlighted in orange. So every triglyceride is going to have this form, thus the tri, three fatty acids, and the glyceride, the glycerol. And there could be a mix of types on the triglyceride. So there could be a monounsaturated fatty acid, a MUFA, there could be a PUFA, there could be a saturated fatty acid. The three fatty acid chains can be different, but uh, there are always three. So what does it mean to be a saturated or an unsaturated fatty acid? Well, a saturated fatty acid has no double bonds. And if you remember from chemistry, a double bond between two carbons indicates that there's probably a hydrogen missing from that chain. If you haven't taken chemistry, it's not a big deal. All you really have to know is that there are no double bonds in a saturated fatty acid. And that means that that chain is fully saturated and it's going to be pretty rigid because it has hydrogens at every point that it could, indicated by the orange circles on this diagram. And so it's going to be pretty rigid and that is why most saturated fats are solid at room temperature. So you can think about animal fats, butter, coconut oil. We will go over their food sources in a minute. So we compare the saturated fatty acid to an unsaturated fatty acid. An unsaturated fatty acid just means that there's a double bond. So you can see that there's a double bond in between two carbons in the diagram. But they also have a mistake in the diagram that the chemistry majors should notice, which is that they didn't remove any of the hydrogens. Once you put in a double bond, that means that you have removed hydrogens or some element from the bonding structure of the element. Unsaturated fatty acids have at least one double bond, therefore they are not fully saturated with hydrogen. Unsaturated. It kind of explains itself when you think about it that way. We bring these back to the different classes of triglycerides. You have your MUFAs that have one double bond. They are monounsaturated. Mono means one, so they have one point of unsaturation. And then you have your PUFAs, which are polyunsaturated, which means multiple, poly, multiple. They have at least two double bonds. And every time you get a double bond in a fatty acid chain, it just is making it more wavy. It's kinking the chain, kinky you might be able to notice even in this diagram where the double bond is, the carbon line kinks a bit. And that just means that's why you find monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids in your oils. Oils are liquid, the, the fatty acids are, you know, boinking around, moving around. And that they can do that because they're unsaturated. So with your classes of triglycerides, you're Big dividers are whether they're saturated or unsaturated. 
And all the difference between those is, is whether they have double bonds or they don't. So there's two classes of PUFAs. There's your omega-3 fatty acids and your omega-6 fatty acids. And then underneath each of those, we have two fatty acids that are kind of special. So your linolenic fatty acid and your linoleic acid. So, you know, could they be more similar? No, um, but they are essential fatty acids. And that means that your body cannot make these fatty acids. And we need essential fatty acids for a variety of functions. So we need them as raw material to make something called eicosanoids, which are biologically active compounds that I'll talk about in a minute. We need them for structural and functional parts of cell membranes. We need them as lipids to brain and nerves. They basically form coatings on your brain and your nerve cells. Uh, they promote normal growth and vision. That's why if you have dry eyes or some vision problems, sometimes your optometrist would prescribe omega-3s, happened to me. Uh, maintain skin, so nice skin quality, you want these fatty acids. Regulate genetic activities impacting metabolism, and then they participate in immune cell functions. We all want great immune cell function now, right? So you wanna be eating omega-3s and omega-6s so you can then provide your body with these essential fatty acids of linoleic and linolenic. Now you see there's another branch on the chain. So linolenic acid goes to make EPA and DHA, which are two additional fatty acids that your body needs. And then linoleic, fatty, linoleic acid goes to make arachidonic acid. Let's talk a little bit about those in a second. But omega-3 fatty acids, as I said, are limited in the US diet. That's why we're always being told to eat more. The dietary guidelines say, please eat more of these. And omega-6s are abundant in the U.S. diet because they're present in a lot of oils that are in other foods, like corn oil, soybean oil, etc. And so we get tons of omega-6s, not a lot of omega-3s. Okay, so I said that um, linolenic and linoleic and essential fatty acids are important. One of their functions is to form eicosanoids. And eicosanoids are biologically active compounds. And so we actually do form eicosanoids from EPA and also arachidonic acid. But what's interesting about this relationship is that the actions of eicosanoids from EPA, from the omega-3 one, and from arachidonic acid, the omega-6 eicosanoid, oppose each other. What do I mean by this? Well, if I tell you what they do, you'll get it. So EPA, the eicosanoid from that, relaxes blood vessels and the eicosanoid from arachidonic acid constricts blood vessels. So you can see then if one of them is relaxing your blood vessels and one of them is constricting, they're opposing each other. They're not really bad or good, but we need them in balance. And because we have so much omega-6 fatty acid in our diet and so little omega-3, it sometimes gets out of balance. Let's take a little bit of a snapshot on omega-3s because as I said, they're recommended in the dietary guidelines that you eat enough of them and they are pretty scarce in our diet but what makes them special is this action on cardiovascular or heart health particularly so as i said they relax our cardiovascular vessels so they can be helpful with heartbeat regulation blood pressure decreasing blood clot formation reducing triglycerides in your blood because you don't want triglycerides floating around in your blood uh, and then decreasing inflammation in general. So all of their heart health benefits are really important. They seem to have some relationship to cancer prevention, but we're not sure what the mechanism is. Uh, they're also important for cell membranes and then brain function and vision, as I mentioned before, when I talked about eicosanoids or essential fatty acids. So omega-3s have these special health benefits and that's why we're always trying to eat more of them basically. Where can we find them? Well, the reason that we don't generally eat a lot of them is because Americans don't eat a lot of the foods that they are prevalent in. The biggest food that omega-3s are in is fish, and especially fatty fish like salmon. So if you're eating salmon, you're probably getting a good amount of omega-3s. They're also in things like chia seed, flaxseed, flaxseed oil, 
They're in other oils like canola oil, um, but canola also has a variety of MUFAs and omega-6s in it. Um, and then they're in like wheat germ as well. So we just don't usually eat a lot of these in the American diet, but it, there are more of these prevalent in like a Mediterranean style diet, which is high in fish and good oils. Omega-6 you can find in a bunch of oils, sunflower, corn, soy, safflower, some nuts like cashews. You can even find it in chicken, which is the bottom picture. I know it's hard to see and then wheat germ. So the sources of both of these um, overlap and that's pretty normal. I'll show you a chart in a minute where a lot of the sources for various fats, you, if you're gonna eat one oil, you're gonna get a variety of fats in that oil. Let's switch from talking about the MUF, the PUFAs, which are our polyunsaturated, like super good fats, to our saturated fatty acids. And saturated fatty acids are another form of triglyceride, and they have associations with more health concerns than the PUFAs. But this is controversial, and your book has an entire section on why this is controversial. But the health concerns for saturated fatty acids are that high intakes are associated with increased cardiovascular disease risk. So unlike the PUFAs where higher intakes are associated with lower heart disease risk, the saturated fatty acids are associated with higher. And lower saturated fat is also necessary to lower your LDL cholesterol. And LDL is like the bad cholesterol, the cholesterol you don't wanna have much of. So we think if you lower your saturated fat, then you can lower your LDL. But as I said, these relationships are very complex. There's a lot of questions about them. There's questions about if saturated fat from dairy is the same as saturated fat from other animal products or manufactured saturated fat. So there are so many questions about saturated fat that it's hard to know exactly if it's horrible for you or not. I don't worry too much about it personally, but um, the dietary guidelines, as I'll, as I'll illuminate in a minute, do have a recommendation for saturated fat that we keep it to less than 10% of our calories. We'll see if that changes in upcoming ones, but I kind of doubt it. The food sources for saturated fat are really animal products and a few plant oils. So saturated fat is found in like any sort of meat, any whole fat dairy, butter, lard, all that's gonna be full of saturated fat. And most saturated fat sources are in these animal products. One notable exception that's become really popular lately is coconut oil. And coconut oil is definitely a saturated fat. So I actually had some coconut oil. I don't use it for cooking, but uh, I use it for something else. And I, noticed on a really hot day this summer that my coconut oil, as you can see on the left picture, had completely gone liquid. So it got hot enough to melt the coconut oil, so it doesn't have that high of a melting point, but at room temperature in like the winter, normal times, it is totally solid. So it is pretty saturated. Saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Uh, and But I just thought it was funny that when it got like 90 degrees in my house, because I made a mistake and opened all the windows, on a really hot day, uh, it went to liquid, which is kind of cool. Fats are really interesting. They all have different melting points, and that's why they have different uses in cooking and things like that. Our next triglyceride is our trans fatty acid, and trans fatty acids. I don't even talk that much about anymore because we really shouldn't have any of them in our diets uh, because they were banned by the Food and Drug Administration recently. Manufacturers can no longer add them to foods. They were added to foods because they provided some qualities that manufacturers really liked, like they increased shelf life, they um, didn't go rancid as quickly, they were, easy, they were cheaper to work with. But once we started adding trans fatty acids to all sorts of things, we realized that they actually increase your bad cholesterol, your LDL, and decrease your HDL or your good cholesterol. So that was problematic. Um, and this is a good example of, you know, trying to invent a new fat that you think is gonna be great, but ends up being like really bad. And a trans fatty acid 
I have this diagram down on the lower left and on the top you can see trans oleic acid and so with a trans fatty acid you have a double bond you can see one right in the middle of that structure of trans oleic acid but there's two types of double bonds this is for chem majors but there's trans and cis and trans double bonds basically the chains will go off opposite sides opposite directions of the double bond cis the two parts of the chain will go off the same direction. So with trans fatty acids, they were able to um, basically make an unsaturated fat act like a saturated fat. So normally uh, when you have a double bond, like on the bottom, the sisoleic acid, you're going to get a kink in that chain because the double bond causes the chain to kink. But a trans fat no longer, did you, with a trans fat, you didn't have that kink anymore. So it acts more like a saturated fat so it's more stable and does a bunch of things that food manufacturers liked a lot. Um, so that is what trans fats are, but as I said, they shouldn't be in any foods. They do naturally occur in dairy, so sometimes you can see them in dairy, but they're thought to have different health effects, perhaps, when that's the case. So I told you I'd show you a chart that has all the different types of oils and fat and then what type of triglycerides are prevalent in them. So this is from your book and you can see that coconut oil, for example, has a lot of saturated fat, uh, the, is the red, and then it has a little bit of green, mufa, and then just a tad bit of blue pufa, omega-6, but no omega-3, which is the orange. Versus if we contrast that with flaxseed or fish oil, they have a ton of orange pufa and then less of all the other categories. But you can see the majority of oils are made up of variety of these fats. Olive oil is a really popular fat. It has a little bit of saturated fat, a little bit, of, a lot of mufa, and then a little bit of pufa. So all their oils are going to be mixes, but some will have predominantly one or the other. Okay, those are triglycerides. Now let's zero in on phospholipids. So phospholipids are different than triglycerides. One, because as you can see in the left hand corner, they have two fatty acid chains instead of three. So they, they have those two orange fatty acid chains and then they are still attached to a glycerol molecule, the blue highlight, and then they have a phosphate group or the, what's in the green circle on the diagram. So they're made up of a phosphate group, a glycerol, and three fatty acid chains. And that structure makes them unique because the, there's part of that structure, the fatty acid tails, that hate water. They are hydrophobic. And then there's part of the structure, the glycerol and the phosphate group, that are hydrophilic. They actually like water. And this makes phospholipids really unique in their function and really important because they are what form the phospholipid bilayer that is the cell membrane of every cell. So they can do this because they put basically, as you can see in the middle diagram, two layers of phospholipids tail to tail. So the tails, the fatty acid tails that hate water are in the middle and then the heads, the hydrophilic heads, are facing like the cellular, intracellular fluid, the watery fluid. And this is a really great way to build the cell wall because you can have the tails in the middle, they're not getting bothered by water, and then you have the water-liking heads touching the watery parts. Functionally with food, this also makes phospholipids good emulsifiers. That just means that they're great at mixing oil and water together. So if you're trying to make mayonnaise or salad dressing, you might use an egg or mustard to bring things together. An egg is a phospholipid and that is why it is able to bring these fat and water together. Um, and then phospholipids also help fats travel through cell membranes, which is an important function. So as I said, one of the cool things about phospholipids is that they can serve as an emulsifier. So here's a little video where the lecithin in egg yolks is serving as an emulsifier between vinegar that I put in the bowl and oil. Oil. 
all that emulsifier means is like it's pulling two things together. So it's pulling something watery together with something fatty or oily. And that the emulsifier is necessary because water and fat will float on top of each other unless you have some agent that's bringing them together. All right, all right, all right. We're down to our last class of lipids, sterols. Sterols include cholesterol, cholesterol, sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and vitamin D is actually also a sterol. So here's all of our sterols. And you can see their structure is kind of all these different ring structures. So they have a very different structure than the phospholipid and the triglyceride, but they're still a type of lipid or fat. And cholesterol is actually a really necessary compound. So we need it for import for bile formation and bile uh, is very important for digesting fat. It's also necessary in cell membranes as components of cell membranes. So although we talk about cholesterol in a lot of negative ways because of its relationship to heart health, it actually has some really positive things that we need it to do as well. And then just to note that there's another type of sterol called plant sterols, and they are really helpful because they compete with cholesterol for absorption. So we won't absorb as much cholesterol and that can help people control their cholesterol. You can sometimes find things like plant store sterols in like knockoff margarines, like I think Benacol, uh, some of those have plant sterols. So those, my friends, are all of our lipids. We've talked through our sterols, phospholipids, and triglycerides. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Fat times three, super fun. Okay guys, so now you know the three types of fat. And I wanna wrap up this video by talking about the recommendations for how much fat you should be eating every day. So we know that the fat we eat is in the triglyceride form. Our saturated fats, our PUFAs, our MUFAs, that's the fat that we're eating. So these recommendations are pertaining to triglycerides. So you wanna have 20 to 35% of your calories every day come from fat. That's the AMDR for fat, 20 to 35% of your calories. The dietary guidelines also suggest that we get less than 10% of our calories from saturated fat. Remember I said there is some controversy around that. So if you're a little bit higher, I don't think this is a problem necessarily, but that's just what the dietary guidelines are recommending. Zero calories from trans fat, as low as possible from trans fat, but again, because it's not allowed to be put in foods anymore, it's really less of a concern than it used to be, meeting that recommendation. And then there are DRIs for PUFAs, for your omega-6s and omega-3s, but because those are not usually labeled on food labels, I don't find it that helpful to get into what the recs are because it's gonna be almost impossible for you to follow them. So those are our fat, fat guidelines. The big one is getting 20 to 35% of our calories from fat. Okay guys, I hope that you really enjoyed this introduction to fat. And next time we're gonna talk about fat digestion and absorption. It's gonna be really special because I think that you're gonna like the way that we're gonna do it. Especially if you are a Miley Cyrus fan, this will really be exciting for you, perhaps. So that's what's coming up from my bookshelf. I will see you later.